This is John Brown in a, a photograph taken by an African-American photographer, one of the very, very few black photographers of the pre-Civil War period, in around 1850 or something like that. Very intense looking fellow, partly because to take daguerreotypes like this, the person had to remain totally still for a couple of minutes, which made them all look intense. But uh, Brown is, extreme, is even more intense than uh, many others. But anyway, so John Brown is one of the most interesting and controversial figures in American history. And talking about John Brown really raises some interesting questions about how we study history as well as the particular events of that period. I guess I should begin by saying I'm actually a member of a very small organization called the John Brown Society which does not meet all that, <laughs> it, 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 does not, it does not meet all that often, but um, I'm part of the moderate, the moderate wing of the John Brown Society. The, the, um, the head of it is position, it, the, the, the aspiration is that John Brown's birthday become a national holiday. Um, I have always argued we need a sort of fallback position in case that doesn't happen anytime soon. So my aim is to get John Brown on a postage stamp, which raises the question of, which I find interesting in a weird way, who gets on a postage stamp anyway and why? Or who doesn't? For example, there is a whole black history series for many years of all sorts of leaders of African American history, male, female, different time periods, but Nat Turner is not on, there was no stamp of Nat Turner. Now why not? Nat Turner was a guy who used violence to try to gain the liberty of his people, as George Washington did, and many other people in our history had. But Nat Turner is not allowed, even though many other African American radicals, Frederick Douglass is on there, many others. Um, what, what is it? Is it that he killed a lot of white people? That excludes you? But wait a minute. There are plenty of Native Americans on postage stamps who killed a lot of white people. Geronimo, Crazy Horse, um, from Little Big Horn, killed a lot more American white people than Custer's group than Nat Turner did. But somehow Native Americans doing that don't seem to bother anybody, whereas African Americans doing it seem to be beyond the pale. Malcolm X is on a stamp. I remember very well when he died a long time ago, he was the mainstream media, Malcolm X was a apostle of racial hatred. That's not the truth, that is what the media said about Malcolm X. But today he's a kind of hero, there is a boulevard named after him, there's a university, he's on a postage stamp. Um, Harry Potter is on a whole series now I just noticed and he didn't even exist. <laughs> so um, John Brown's farm, in upstate New York, if you've ever been there, in the, uh, in the Adirondacks near Lake Placid is a state historical site, New York State, but not a national historical site. It's worth visiting, though, if you ever find yourself up in that neck of the woods. Um, so there is the, there's sort of the, 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 there's the real John Brown, and then there is sort of the legend of John Brown. And in a sense, historically, the legend is more important than the actual person. Um, John Brown's career, most of it was fairly undistinguished. Um, his raid on Harper's Ferry, which we will talk about in a minute, was unsuccessful, let's say. But the image, the legend of John Brown helped his ultimate aim succeed, which was to destroy the institution of slavery. Most, there are a lot of biographies of John Brown, but they are, um, most of them are either trying to prove or disprove the legend of John Brown as the man who struck the first blow to destroy slavery. So they're all kind of, they're part of a debate which is maybe not the best way to approach this anyway. But this sort of crisis of Harper's Ferry, 1859, which we'll talk about in a second, um, is part of a larger crisis. Brown is important partly because he reflects a larger crisis of the anti-slavery movement. We've been talking about the rise of the Republican Party. It seems sort of inexorable that the Republican Party will rise, take over power, there'll be a civil war, slavery will end. 
It's obvious, but it wasn't obvious to people at the time. In fact, in the late 1850s, many abolitionists were in despair about the failure of the movement against slavery. I mean, the federal government was more under the control of the South than ever, the Dred Scott decision, the Buchanan administration. Um, the, the, no, the, for 30 years, the abolitionist movement had been using what they call moral suasion, that is to persuade people to end slavery, and yet there were probably two million more slaves in the country in 1860 than there were when the abolitionist movement began in 1830. So they hadn't accomplished anything, really. Um, and um, the movement, th this led many, uh, many abolitionists to start talking about maybe moral suasion isn't the only possible tactic. Some you went into politics. What about violence? What about violence to attack slavery? There was violence. There was violence in Kansas. There was violence on the floor of Congress, as we've seen. There was violence in resisting the fugitive slave law. There were violent altercations in northern communities in the 1850s. In Christiana, Pennsylvania, a, I think I mentioned this a few weeks ago, the, um, you know, a slave owner was killed by a crowd who were trying to apprehend a, when he was trying to apprehend a fugitive slave. Slaves were rescued from courthouses violently. In other words, violence was in the air, and more and more abolitionists began to say, well, maybe just our pacifist approach is not the, is not the right way. It hasn't accomplished what we, what we wanted. Um, so um, to us, as I say, 1859 is the eve of the Civil War. But people did not know that in 1859, and that is not how they saw the world uh, that, they were, that they were living in. Um, this crisis of the abolitionist movement led in all sorts of directions, not just more willingness to use violence. It led to a re-emphasis on a doctrine that William Lloyd Garrison had put forth in the late 1830s of disunion. The North should secede from the South. The North, the Union should be broken up be, to A, to sort of sever the North from its connection with the morally unjust system of slavery. And also, the theory was it would weaken the South if it didn't have the North to sort of depend on. Um, so there was a growing disunion movement um, among abolitionists, not most others, in, in the North. Among African Americans, there was a growing acceptance in the 1850s of the idea of emigration. I talked last time about Lincoln and others talking about colonization, that is the government encouraging or forcing black people to leave the country for Africa or Central America. That's not quite the same thing, but it's in the same ballpark as emig voluntary emigration. Martin Delaney, great black abolitionist, launched a whole black emigration movement in the 1850s. He actually went to explore the Niger River Delta. Uh, uh, in, in fact, Delaney is the first Westerner to trace the course of the Niger River in Africa. Of course, Africans knew where it went, but Westerners didn't know, but many near the coast, uh, apart from the coast. And he was looking for a homeland for black Americans. Even the great Frederick Douglass, who had powerfully opposed emigration. He said the notion that we are not Americans is the foundation of racism here. If we give up our claim to equal rights in the United States, we will lose the whole battle. By 1860, Douglas himself was willing to contemplate blacks emigrating to Haiti, or at least he was planning to visit Haiti for the first time to look into the situation there as a possible place for an African-American uh, homeland. This was a complete um, change of attitude. Douglas, in an editorial in his, I guess at that, he published many newspapers, but I think it was a monthly at that point, Douglas's monthly. In August 1860, he wrote, the cause, the anti-slavery cause, is shrouded in doubt and gloom. Shrouded in doubt and gloom. The labor of a quarter of a century has reached a point of hopelessness. That's not what we normally think about on the eve of the Civil War. The, the abolitionist crusade had reached a point of hopelessness, says uh, Douglas. Now, Brown is aware of these trends and is part of these trends. Um, 
But he was the only one to translate the rhetoric of violence into real action, not just to rescue individuals, but to try to assault the institution of, uh, of slavery. Um, most of the violence in this period was not by abolitionists, but against them. In Kansas, there was much more violence by pro-slavery forces from Missouri than anti-slavery settlers. Um, but the violence that is happening is creating an atmosphere that makes violence more acceptable. Let's just put it that way. Brown is an abolitionist who takes violent means. That's what sets him apart from so many of the others.